Math 1314, Tyler Junior College, Section 1.5, Quadratic Equations, Video 7 of 10. In the previous couple of videos, we explored how to solve a quadratic equation by completing the square. It was kind of necessary to develop a new technique because the previous two techniques, solving by factoring and solving using square roots, aren't always applicable to a generic quadratic equation. You can't solve by factoring if the polynomial won't factor, if it's prime. And you can only solve using square roots if there's only one x term, but a general quadratic equation has both an x squared and an x term, and therefore solving by using square roots is not possible until you fix that. We solved some uh, quadratic equations by completing the square, and we still have the, the list on how to do that, so just to review it really quickly. Uh, the first move is to rewrite the equation so that it starts with x squared, is followed by an x term, but the constant is on the other side of the equation. And then we perform the completing the square move by adding the perfect constant. We do that by taking half of the coefficient of the x and then squaring it. Now, whatever we get, we add to both sides. As a consequence of that move, the left will factor into the square of the binomial, reducing the equation from two x terms to one, and then we can finish solving by using square roots. But can we do that in a generic sense? In other words, can we pull off all those moves when we don't have specific values here? And if we can, what does it mean when we get to the end? Well, let's find out. If we want to solve any quadratic equation by completing the square, our first objective is to get the equation in this form. Don't focus so much on the fact that there's a b here and a c there, and there's a b here and a c there. When you see something generic mathematically, you should really focus more on the structure than the actual names of the letters. And again, the structure of this equation is it starts with an x squared, it's followed by the x term, and then the constant is on the other side of the equation. So if we're gonna make that happen here, we need to fix two things. Number one, we needed to start with x squared, not ax squared. And number two, we need the constant term, whatever it's going to be, to be on the other side of the equation. I do wanna stipulate in this equation, we are going to work on the assumption that the leading coefficient, the a, is not equal to zero, because if it were, this term would vanish and it wouldn't be a quadratic equation anymore. Plus, it's going to be important that the a is not equal to zero in our very first move. All right, so let's try to solve this general quadratic equation by completing the square. If we're going to convert the equation to this form, let's start by focusing on the fact that the coefficient of the x squared needs to be a 1, not some generic number. So how can we fix that? Well, this number is attached by multiplication, so we can divide both sides by a. Equivalently, we can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of a. So let's multiply both sides of this equation by the reciprocal of a, 1 over a. So multiply on the left, multiply on the right, and let's see what happens as a consequence of that move. We do have to invoke the distributive property. So the 1 over a will get distributed to all three terms on the left. When we multiply 1 over a times a, it becomes a 1. 1 times x squared is x squared. That's the whole reason we did that move. The rest of it, not as pretty. 1 over a times b is b over a. And if that's not clear, put the b over a 1 and then just multiply the fractions. That is still the coefficient of the x plus 1 over a times c for the same reason if you put the c over 1. 1 over a times c is c over a. The right side of the equation is a little bit easier. 1 over a times 0 is 0. Okay? So we've got the first part of the structure that we need for the first step. We've got the x squared, but we need the constant term on the right side of the equal sign. Which of these is the constant term? Remember, the a, the b, and the c are just numbers that we don't know. The x is the variable. The constant term is the term without the variable. So it's this plus c over a. So we need to move it to the right side by subtracting it from both sides. And that'll give us x squared plus b over ax, we'll leave a space here, equals negative c over a. 
And if you're wondering, why did you put that way over there? Because I know what's about to happen. All right, so what's our next move? We just finished step one. Our next move is to, <clears throat> excuse me, complete the square. Find the perfect number to go here that will cause the left side to factor into something squared. Now, don't be intimidated by the fact that I'm going to try to factor something that not only contains fractions, but unknown values. Uh, recall that the factorization in the completing the square process is very predictable. But first, we've got to complete the square. We've got to figure out what number to go here. Our second step says to add half of b squared to both sides. And again, this is where you have to focus on the structure and not the specific letters being represented. Structurally speaking, what the second step is saying is take the coefficient of the x and do this to it. Okay? Here's the coefficient of the x. It's b over a. Let's do that to it. We're going to take half of b over a. And remember, half of is the same as one half times. One half times b over a, which isn't nearly as bad as it seems. Just multiply. One times b is b. Two times a is 2a. But then after we take half, then we got a square. So we have to square this. b over 2a squared. When you square a fraction, you can square each side of it. So on the top, we get b squared. And when you square a multiplication problem, you can square each of its factors. 2 squared is 4. a squared is, well, a squared. So this is what we need to add to both sides. So we'll add it on the left plus b squared over 4a squared. And we'll also add it on the right side, but I'm going to put it in front of the minus sign. That's why I left a space there. I wanted the right side to actually look like a subtraction problem. If I, I could have written negative c over a plus b squared over 4a squared, I just think it looks cleaner as a subtraction problem. All right, so that's the move that completes the square. It's as messed up as it looks, it's correct. The third step is to factor the left into a perfect square, which looks intimidating, unless you remember a little gimmick that I told you in previous videos. If you've successfully completed the square, this factorization is predictable. Open up some parentheses, start it with an x. Then, what follows the x is whatever you got after doing your first move in the completing the square process. In other words, when you do the half of move, that result is what goes here. Half of b over a is b over 2a, and it looks positive, so I'm going to write a plus. I only said it looks positive because we don't know if the a or the b is negative, but generically speaking, this looks positive, so I'm going to write a plus. And if you don't believe that's the factorization, write this out twice, boil it, and it'll take you back here. It's not as hard as it seems. Now on the right side, what we normally do is complete the subtraction problem. And we're going to attempt to complete it the best that we can. We won't get a number answer, ob obviously. But we, we are being asked to subtract two fractions. And the rule for subtracting is get a common denominator, combine the numerators. Okay, let's see if we can get common denominators here. It's actually easier, in my opinion, to build common denominators when you have variables instead of numbers because you can see what each denominator is contained, uh, contains and see what it's missing. For example, this first denominator has a 4 and an a squared. So it has a 4, an a, and another a. The second denominator only has a 4. It's, excuse me, the second denominator only has an a. So it's missing the 4, and it's missing a second a. Now that I know what it's missing, I know what to give it. I'm going to give this denominator a 4, but I have to give it on the top also. And I have to give it another a, so I, but I have to give it on the top also. By doing that, that will make this fraction... I tell you what, let, let's, let's do a little thought cloud here. Let's do a thought cloud. We currently have b squared over 4a squared, and let's clean this fraction up a little bit. Uh, the denominator is going to be 4a squared, that's what we were shooting for. In the numerator, we have 4 times c times a, and although that's a perfectly acceptable order in which to write them, normally when you have a product of variables that are written in alphabetical order, it's not necessary, but we're going to do that. 
So we're going to write the top as 4ac. And now that these two fractions have a common denominator, I can combine them into one fraction by simply combining the numerators. So the common denominator is 4a squared, and the numerator will be b squared minus 4ac. Some of you may start having a minor epiphany right now and realizing, oh, I know where this is going. If not, don't worry. That's okay. So we finished step three. We factored the left into a perfect square, and we went ahead and combined the terms on the right side. And then the fourth and final step is to solve using square roots, which is a, a task in its own right. Remember, to solve using square roots, you take the square root of both sides, or at least the best that you can. So here's the square, square root of the left side, and here's the messy square root of the right side. And as a consequence of that, there's two things you have to be aware of. Number one, the square root cancels the square. So we have x plus b over 2a equals, and number two, you have to use a plus minus on the right side. Now, I could just drag this whole giant square root over here and drop it there, but let me think about what I can and cannot do here. Um, you can distribute a square root across a fraction. You can distribute a square root across a multiplication problem, uh, provided at least one thing is positive. But what you can't do is distribute a square root across addition or subtraction. I know it may seem inconvenient to say, well, sometimes you say I can and sometimes you say I can't, and I can't remember which one is which. Okay, fair enough. Here's a way to remember when you can and cannot distribute. It boils down to the order of operations, which most people refer to as PEMDAS, or please excuse my daring Sally. Most people write it left to right. I write it like a totem pole, and I put MD on the same level and AS on the same level, because in the order of operations, multiplication and division have the same precedence, so you just work them left to right. The same thing with addition and subtraction. If you can remember this visual for the order of operations, then here's a way that you can remember when you can and cannot distribute. You can distribute multiplication and division across addition and subtraction. Uh, there are a couple of subtle times when you can't involving subtraction and division, or involving division, I should say. But in general, you can distribute multiplication and division across addition and subtraction. You can also distribute multiplication excuse me, exponents across multiplication and division. And by the way, where do square roots fall in this order of operations? They actually fall on the same level as exponents for reasons which we'll review later when we get to chapter four. So you can distribute exponents and square roots across multiplication and division. You can mostly distribute multiplication and division across addition and subtraction. But what you cannot do is skip a level. You cannot distribute and skip a level. So you cannot distribute exponents and square roots across addition and subtraction. So if you think of the distributive property as distributing one operation across the one below it in the order of operations, that will help you remember when you can and cannot do things by like square rooting stuff. So we can distribute a square root across a fraction, but we can't distribute it across the subtraction sign. So let's go ahead and distribute the square root across the fraction, and if we distribute it across uh, to the top, we get the square root of b squared minus 4ac. Now, you may be tempted to cancel the square and the square root here, but you can't get the square root to just the b squared, because you would be trying to distribute the square root across the subtraction. Can't do that. And we can uh, square root the denominator. Wait a minute. I'm going to write the square root of 4a squared, but the minute I write that, I'm thinking I can do that problem. Because you can distribute a square root across multiplication. So yes, I can square root this by square rooting each half of it. The square root of 4 is 2, and on the square root of a squared, it cancels the square. So I'm just going to erase the square root of 4a squared and replace it with what it is equal to, which is 2a. In the event that there's a nitpicky mathematician watching this, yes, I am aware that the square root of a squared could be negative a. 
this takes care of that. Let's continue. Oh, we're solving for x. All we have to do is move this guy over here. But before we move it over there, notice that we're going to have two fractions on the right side that already have a common denominator. So I can and should combine them and keep that same denominator, 2a. When I move the b over, it's going to become negative, and it's going to be sitting in front of the plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. Well, that was a lot to do. But the purpose of doing it was to answer the question, if we complete the square on a general quadratic equation, is there a quicker way to just calculate the solutions? And the answer is yes. This, this basically says, if you can tell me what the a, the b, and the c are in this equation, do this to them, and it's a lot to do, do this to them, and you'll have your solutions. And you can completely bypass the completing the square process, because you already have a generic result. You may recognize this. Oh, you don't? Well, watch the next video.